Hello, and welcome to Listen Up, Using Audiobooks for English Teaching. My name is Jenny Hodgson, and I'm a materials writer and editor in the Department of State, and I'm also normally your moderator for these webinars, but today I'll be your presenter. We're going to talk about why audiobooks can be an effective tool for English teaching and how to implement them in your classrooms. But before we begin talking about the whys and the hows of audiobooks, I'd like to show you some of the free and downloadable resources that we have available for you. So here are the audiobooks that we have available. These audiobooks are not just the original version, but they're simplified versions for English language learners. We have Huckleberry Finn, which is my personal favorite, Tom Sawyer, Raggedy Ann Stories, which is for young learners, the Red Badge of Courage, The Autobiography of Mark Twain, The Gift of the Magi, Edgar Allan Poe, and To Build a Fire. On our website, you can download both the text and audio files. OK, moving on. Now we're going to talk about why to use audiobooks with English language learners. But first, I want to hear from you. Please share in the chat box some of the benefits that you have found, or if you haven't used audiobooks yet, um, benefits that you think audiobooks would have for your students. So some of the things that I found is that it's fun to hear different accents. And this is very true. Um, it's also, it also can increase interest in um, the books, for example, some students may not like to read, but listening to these different accents can increase their interest. Also, it can help with fluency, listening to different dialects. Um, it can improve reading skills and critical thinking skills. Great, those are all really great ideas. Thank you for sharing. And there are many reasons to use audiobooks. Um, especially recently, there's been a lot of research looking into the benefits of these audiobooks in the classroom. And there's been a lot of favorable results, especially with English language learners and improving their reading skills. So let's discuss some of these reasons why. I want to know, do you think English pronunciation is difficult? If yes, please raise your hand. So English is not a phonetic language, and many of you might have, your native language might be phonetic, meaning that it looks the way it sounds, so when you read it off a of paper, it's going to sound like that when you say the word. But English, in many cases, is not like that, and so it can be especially challenging for students whose first language is phonetic. But this is how, uh, one reason that audiobooks can help. It exposes students to patterns, intonations, expressions, different accents and dialogues, and pronunciation of a language. So the students will be able to make that connection between the written and the spoken word. If they're listening to an audiobook, uh, especially if they're listening to the audiobook while following along in the text. Um, additionally, many of our students are only exposed to English during class time, and they only hear you, the teacher. So even if they under, one Brazilian student understands another Brazilian or their Brazilian teacher speaking English very well, they may not understand at all if they hear an Australian or an Indian or even an American speaking English. But by listening to audiobooks, as you mentioned in the chat box, um, students are getting exposed to different accents and dialects and can understand that English can sound very different. And also listening to the stress patterns and patterns will help students understand um, and improve not only pronunciation, but comprehension. Listening to audiobooks also provides an example of fluent reading. Fluency is uh, a key component of literacy. Students, especially English language learners, can often struggle with reading fluently because they're focusing on reading at the word level and perhaps getting stuck on some of the words because they can't think of how to pronounce it, or they can't think of the meaning, and they aren't able to read fluently. So listening to audiobooks, especially, again, while following along with the text, can help students with this. 
Okay, I have another poll question for you. And I think I have a good idea of what the answer will be, but how many of your students enjoy reading? All of them, meaning 100% of your students, many, which means you know, about 75, some, 50, 50, few, less than 25, or none of your students. Many, that's a great answer, that's exciting to see. Um, but we know that probably all of our students don't like to read. One of the ways that we can help students enjoy reading is by using audiobooks because, as we mentioned before, it can be fun to listen to different dialects. Um, and especially if the book is a dramatized audiobook or it's being read by a professional voice actor or there are many characters um, that are reading the different parts, it can really increase the student's interest in um, books. If you're working with very young learners who can't read yet, Playing audiobooks will also increase students' interest in reading at a younger age. In fact, studies have shown that students who are read to at home when they are young are better readers when they get older. And this goes for audiobooks as well. Yes. So, dramatized audiobooks can increase students' interest in the text. Audiobooks can also, in some cases, allow readers to enjoy a book at their, at their interest level, even if it's above their reading level. So some of your students may be struggling with reading. Maybe they struggle with reading in their native language and in English, um, but they can understand a lot of English. This will allow a student to access content that is relevant for their age, um, even if it's above their reading level. Audiobooks can also allow students to work at the same pace. Having students do independent reading tasks in class can often be really challenging because all students read at different paces. The faster students can get bored or even just disruptive if they finish early, and the slower students can feel frustrated and embarrassed or not even finish the text at all because they don't want to show that they haven't finished yet. So playing an audiobook in class can have everyone working at the same pace. Using audiobooks can also reach more learners. With text and audio, reading becomes a multi-sensory approach, so tapping into more multiple intelligences. And with that, audiobooks support auditory learners, which are about 30% of the population. So you are reaching that many more students by using audio and especially when using text and audio together. And for reasons I mentioned before, such as expression, pronunciation, intonation, um, this can help with literacy development, um, fluent reading, and again, can in, um, improve the comprehension of the text. Because perhaps um, when you read a sentence, you don't know that the character is angry, but by listening to the audiobook and hearing the stress in the character's voice, you can pick up on that character's emotion. Okay, so before we move on, I just want to know if there's any other reasons why you can think of to use audiobooks that we may have missed or haven't talked about yet. And I thank you for your ideas so far. I know that there are many more out there. And as um, one of our participants says, it's just a fun change of pace. Um, it's something, if you haven't tried it before, then it's definitely going to be fun and new because they haven't um, been exposed to it yet. But it just changes things up. Uh, you get to listen to different accents and um, just do something different in class. Okay, so we're going to spend most of this webinar, or the rest of this webinar, talking about how to use, or specific activities to use with audiobooks in your classroom as part of your lesson with the whole class. But in addition to using audiobooks with the whole class, there are a few other ways we can put audiobooks to use in reading groups or centers, um, as classroom management strategies, and independently in class and outside of class. So let's talk about reading centers. In your classroom, besides having the entire class listen to the same audiobook, you can set up your class in probably many different ways, but I'm just going to talk about two here. The first one, 
let's say you have four different tasks that you want the students to do that day. One involves instruction from you, and the other three are tasks that students can do in groups or pairs or even independently. So rather than having all of the class do the same thing at once, have them work in stations. And this, again, will especially work in a large class because now you're breaking it down and you're able to give students more attention when you're working with them and they can focus more on their group work and independent work at different stations. So having one station reserved for the audiobook, um, you can make sure that students are on task by giving them the text to follow along, um, having them answer questions while they listen, or even leaving discussion questions with the group for them to discuss afterwards. And the second classroom setup that you see is another way to use reading centers, and it's by having multiple books. In this case, I chose four, one in each corner. And this, in this scenario, you can allow students to choose which book they want to read. Um, this gets students more invested, more interested, because they're taking some ownership over what they're reading and they get to decide, you know, what sounds most interesting to them. So they can choose their reading center and in a group listen to the audiobooks together. Um, it might be a little tricky if you have a small class or it's loud, but if you can um, move to different spaces, perhaps put a group outside. If that's possible, that would work best. But if not, just either um, try to have the volume, you know, high enough where the students in the group can hear, but it doesn't disrupt the rest of the class. And if everyone wants the same book, well, then you can work with it as the whole group. Um, and that'll work, too. But at least they've made the choice, and they're not being forced to read the same book if they don't want to. I really like this quote from one of the articles on the Ning, and it says, there's no such thing as a child who hates to read. There are only children who have not found the right book. And I think that, um, it, at least in schools in the US, we're seeing more and more that students are being given more and more of a choice on what they read, because the most important thing is getting the students reading, and not necessarily that every single student has to read this one classic novel. And I really believe this quote. Um, I grew up reading a lot. I loved reading. I didn't struggle with it. But I realized later when I began to study education that that's really not the case for a lot of students, maybe even over 50%. And a lot of kids don't like reading. Um, I used to challenge myself because I had this one friend who claimed that he'd never read a book in his whole life um, to try to find the perfect book. And I, I didn't, but um, recently he switched careers and he now reads books all the time. So. Maybe we need to change that quote to, there is no such thing as a person who hates to read. Um, but I do think it's true that, they, that people just need to find the right book to read and everyone can be a reader. OK, so now for the fun stuff. Nope, not fun yet. Sorry. <laughs> so there's a few other ways that we can use audiobooks besides reading centers. And that's, as I mentioned, classroom management tools. So what are some things that you reward students for? Um, if you get, if students do um, really start enjoying listening to audiobooks, you can use this as a reward for good behavior or good work. And something, as I just mentioned before, that can really encourage students is allowing them to bring in an audio file of a book that they really like, if that's possible. You can also use it as a warm-up during a transition or even at the end of class. Um, one thing that we probably notice, especially with our middle and high school students, is that it can be sometimes really tricky to get students settled. Perhaps you have an especially talkative bunch. Um, maybe you don't want to use a warm-up that gets students talking. Maybe your goal is to get them quiet. So perhaps every day as students are entering the class, have an audiobook playing so that they're getting settled quietly and actually getting interested in the book. Perhaps by the end of the year, you'll have gotten through an entire book just by listening to the audiobook for a few minutes at the beginning of each class um, while you're taking attendance, students are getting out their homework, et cetera. So you're getting two things done at once. You can also try playing audiobooks when students are doing something boring, such as cleaning up or other tasks around the classroom. Maybe you have cleanup time once a month or you have students hanging things around the walls, why not play an audiobook while they're doing these tasks? And finally, 
um, the last way to encourage students to use audiobooks is independently. And I have two questions about your students. One is, how many of your students have an MP3 player? And a lot of um, phones can play MP3s, so I think a cell phone will count. And also, how many of your students have access to the internet? Great. Well, in some cases, this is better than um, the access that we have to hard copies of books. Um, you know, in some places, books are very easy to come by. In other places, it's really hard or very expensive to get a book. Um, it can be, you know, they have to be shipped across the ocean or, you know, you need access to paper and printing. So um, because of the digital world that we live in today, audiobooks can actually be really easy to access. Um, they don't need to be shipped, they don't need to be printed, they can be just downloaded onto your device, and there's many online that are free. So there are really a lot of benefits to encouraging students to listen to audiobooks independently. Um, one of a major one is just that students are getting exposure to English outside of class. Um, as we talked about before, maybe the only English that students hear is with their teacher in class. Um, so again, students are listening to different accents and pronunciation of the language. Um, as I mentioned, audiobooks can also be easier to access than um, a hard copy of a book. And it can also be easier to listen to audiobooks because you can be doing something else while essentially listening or reading. The other day I was talking to one of my colleagues about um, commuting and reading, and I really like to read books on my way to work, um, but a lot of times I can only read it for a couple minutes uh, when I'm on the bus. Um, but many people sometimes have to walk from their house to the bus, the bus to the train, switch trains, walk from the train to their office, so out of maybe that 45 minutes, only 10 or 20 minutes is reading time. But if you're listening to an audiobook, from the time you walk out of your house, to the time you enter the office or school, you can be listening to your book. So you're getting a lot more reading done. So raise your hand if your students have more than a five minute commute to school. So many of you um, can, can let your students know that this is something that they can do. And it's you know, something that sometimes is very exciting if they don't have friends with them or something. This is um, something that can make that time pass interestingly. Um, also, if they can't do it on the commute, they could also do it while um, doing daily chores, such as sweeping or cooking or gardening. Again, you can't read a book while doing those things, but you could listen to an audiobook. And a way to encourage students to read or listen to audiobooks or regular books outside of the class is to offer incentives. Um, something that I've never forgotten as a child is the summer reading programs that we had. Um, every summer, at the end of the year, we'd get a piece of paper and we had to fill in um, the titles of all the books we read and our parents signed after we finished each book. And then when we got back to school in the fall, there was different prizes or awards for students that read a certain number of books and then for the person that read the most. And it doesn't have to be a monetary reward. It can be just recognizing that student for their hard work or giving a certificate or maybe a free homework pass or something along those lines. Okay, and now for the fun stuff. Activities for using audiobooks in your classrooms. Um, so when we're talking about reading and listening, what are the skills that we're actually trying to teach our students? Can anyone think of some of the skills that we're teaching? For example, vocabulary building. That's one skill. Another is critical thinking. That's a great one. Um, listening and or reading comprehension, so understanding what happened. Listening and reading for details. So why is that different than reading comprehension and why is listening or reading for details important? Um, because sometimes we just need to know the summary in general, but other times there's a small piece of information that can be really important to you know, a specific task that we're doing or on a test or you know whatever the reason is, but students need to be able to listen for those details when asked to. 
Another skill is summarizing and sequencing. So be able to briefly explain what happened and also be able to tell you in what order the events happened in. And two other skills are prediction and analysis. And these are somewhat higher level thinking skills. So students aren't only understanding what happened in the story, but using their knowledge of the world and their background knowledge and their creativity and critical thinking um, to look at the story in a different way. Okay, so we're going to start off with vocabulary, vocabulary activities. One activity we can do is have students listen for specific words, such as high-frequency words like articles, forms of to be, question words. We can have them listen for new vocabulary, such as places in a town or emotions or whatever you're focusing on. Um, or even highlighting a specific grammar point, so something that maybe you're introducing or something that you're reviewing. Uh, maybe have them listen for present perfect verbs or going to, et cetera. So ways that you can um, see if students are hearing the words that you've asked them to listen for are by having them raise their hand or stand up, which is my personal favorite because I think students need to move. Um, or if you don't want students to see when each other hears the words, have them keep a tally on their piece of paper. And you can also have students put the words that they hear into categories. Um, for example, students are learning how to describe people. They could place adjectives that describe appearance in one category and adjectives that describe personality in another. OK, listen up. We are going to try the first activity together. Today I have assigned four people four different words. Since we are in a virtual classroom, this is going to work a little bit differently. Instead of actually standing up, the four people are going to type stand up into the chat box when they hear the word that they've been assigned. Everybody else is a guesser. So when you see someone type in stand up, try to figure out which word they've been assigned. For example, and then write your guess into the chat box. So for example, if you think that my word is broccoli, write into the chat box Jenny Broccoli. Okay? So we're going to play the first audio file and let's see if we can guess what the four listeners have been assigned. Suddenly Tom thought of something. Do you have any bugs in here? No, I don't. Uh, we have to get you some. But I don't want any bugs in here. I don't like bugs. I'm afraid of them. I'd rather have a poisonous snake in here than bugs. Well, that's a good idea. I'm sure that that's been done in some book. Where could you keep it? Keep what, Tom? A poisonous snake. A poisonous snake? If a snake came in here, I would break through the door and leave in a hurry. Even if I had to use my head to break through the door. You wouldn't be afraid of it after a while. If you treated the snake in a friendly manner, you'd begin to like it. The snake would begin to love you, too, and want to sleep with you. Tom, I don't want a snake to love me. What the snake will do is bite me. Can't you at least try to live with a poisonous snake? All I'm asking is for you to try. But I'll die if the snake bites me. Then you won't need to set me free. If you refuse to cooperate, we'll bring you a harmless snake. We'll simply imagine that it's poisonous. I could manage with a harmless snake, but I would far rather have no snakes at all. I never knew that it would be so difficult to be a prisoner. It's difficult when it's done properly. You have any rats in here? No, I haven't seen any rats. Well, we'll get you some rats, too. But, Tom, I don't want any rats. They might bite my toes and awaken me when I'm sleeping. You can put a harmless snake in here with me, but not rats. Mm -hmm. Great. You guys did really great with that activity. And I, I'm sorry if some of you have already seen that one, but I love it so much and I had to do it again. 
Okay, so here are the instructions for the activity that we just did. Assign each student or groups of students, depending on the size of the class, one or more words that they will hear. You can choose vocabulary words or keywords in the story. Have students stand up or raise their hand each time they hear the assigned word, or have them keep a tally. One thing that you can do is if they have an action word or a verb, such as smile or clap, they can stand up and do the action each time they hear the word so you know that they really understand. Okay, so let's see if we figured out the four words that our listeners were assigned. In chapter 36 of Huckleberry Finn, um, we heard these four words many times, and I saw a lot of you guessed correctly um, who was assigned these words. And in, in the classroom, you could actually have the students stand up, but we just wrote stand up in the chat box. Okay, are you ready for activity two? This time, I want you to listen for all the locations that you might find in a city or village or town and type them into the chat box. Are you ready? Recently, someone in Missouri has sent me a picture of the house I was born in. Heretofore, I have always stated that it was a palace. But I shall be more careful now. The village has two streets, each a couple of hundred yards long, covered with stiff black mud in wet times, deep dust in dry. Most of the houses were of logs. There were none of brick and none of stone. There was a log church, which was a schoolhouse on weekdays. There were two stores in the village. My uncle owned one of them. It was very small with a few rolls of cloth, a few barrels of salt fish, coffee, and sugar. Okay, great job. Um, I see a lot of you came up with a lot of answers. Let's see if my list matches yours. Village, house, palace, street, church, schoolhouse, and store. Great, I see that you've got them all. Okay, now. We're going to listen again, but this time I want you to write down any words or phrases that describe the locations in the village that we put on our list, okay? So let's listen again. Recently, someone in Missouri has sent me a picture of the house I was born in. Heretofore, I have always stated that it was a palace, but I shall be more careful now. The village has two streets, each a couple of hundred yards long, covered with stiff black mud in wet times, deep dust in dry. Most of the houses were of logs. There were none of brick and none of stone. There was a log church, which was a schoolhouse on weekdays. There were two stores in the village. My uncle owned one of them. It was very small with a few rolls of cloth, a few barrels of salt fish, coffee, and sugar. All right, great. A lot of you had a lot of um, descriptions, or words or phrases that were describing any of these locations. Let's see if we found the same ones. So for village, I didn't really hear a descriptive word, but I bet we could take a guess based on the rest of this story, what, how to describe the village. House. Mark Twain said the houses were all made of logs, none of brick or stone. The palace, I also didn't hear a description of that. Um, what about the streets? A couple hundred yards, thick black mud in wet times, deep dry dust in dry times. The church was made of logs as well. And the schoolhouse actually is the church. And then he said the two s'mores, two stores were small. So another activity that you could do to extend this is to ask students to make all of these phrases or words into adjectives. So instead of house made of logs, we could say log house or a 
street that's a couple hundred yards, to me that's a short street or a muddy street or a dry, dusty street or a small store. So again, um, when we do this kind of activity, we have to think about what might be tricky for our students. Some of the things we just talked about. Um, small store is probably easy, but a street that is a couple hundred yards, what does that mean? Um, what other phrases did you hear that might be tricky for your students? So making sure that you're listening to the file before and then thinking about what students might not understand. And here's some questions you could ask your students. Was there a palace in the town? How do we know? So there wasn't a palace in the town. What um, Mark Twain said was that he used to refer to his house as a palace until he recently saw a picture of it. So I think we can also guess then that Mark Twain's house was probably small. I already answered my own question. Do you think Mark Twain's house was big or small? How do you know? Good. And finally, the streets were a couple hundred yards. So this is the unit of measurement that we use in the US. Um, what unit of measurement is used in your country that could be similar to yards? And if you don't know, that's OK. It's meters. So if a street was a couple of hundred meters, to you, how would you describe that street? Maybe in some places that's a long street. Maybe in other places that's a really short street. So thinking about your context, but then also thinking about the context of the story. OK, there's one final step in this activity. Now, you're going to put your students into pairs and have them discuss what they believe the town to look like. So we've already heard a lot of descriptions. Maybe they can elaborate and then draw a picture or a map of the town. Now, your students shouldn't stress. It's not about creating a masterpiece, but the goal is to check for comprehension. But I'll share with you my masterpiece. OK, I didn't draw this, but if you look closely, the sign does say small town Mississippi. So it might just be Mark Twain's real hometown, or a picture that someone made up for Mark Twain's real hometown. Anyway, so what school or what skills did the students use to complete the activity we just did? What did they have to do? First, they had to listen. Then they had to categorize words. They had to listen again and they had to write, then they had to discuss, then they probably had to do some either critical thinking or at least collaborating to agree on what they wanted to have their town look like, and then they had to draw the picture. So they did a lot of different things in that activity. So can you think of any other vocabulary building activities that we could use with audiobooks? Please share in the chat box, and you can also share all of your ideas on the Ning after the webinar. All right, moving on to a different listening and reading skill, sequencing and summarizing. So due to our time constraints today, I won't play an audio file for this activity, but you can do this with pretty much any story. So why do we do activities related to sequencing and summarizing? Why is it important? And we talked a little bit about this before. So checking for comprehension. If a student can summarize what happened in a story, obviously they understood. And if a student can tell you the order that something happened, again, they understood. Also a critical thinking skill. So what are some activities that you currently do in your classroom that involve sequencing and summarizing? And it doesn't have to be um, with audiobooks. It can be with any kind of activity. So paper strip, strip activities. I bet a lot of teachers do that, where you give students a story or a, a paragraph, and they have to put it in order. That's a great one. Um, so this is, is somewhat similar to that. Um, in this case, the students would listen to 
a part of a story two to three times, or as many as you think is necessary. And just quickly write down what happens in the story. They can just write notes or words, whatever will remind them of what happened. And then have students rewrite what happens in complete sentences. And you may want to note that they only need to write, you know, six or eight sentences and not the whole story word for word. Once they've completed that, put students into pairs and have them compare the sentences that they wrote. Then in pairs, have students select four or six of the most important parts um, of the story that they wrote and write them onto strips of paper. Finally, have each pair mix their sequence. So take their six strips, for example, and mix them all up and then trade with another group. Now each group should try to sequence the other group's cards. So if they were able to summarize the story and write a sequence of their own, um, even though the other group's sentences might be slightly different, they should still be able to do the activity because they understood the story. So what are all the skills that students use to complete this activity? First, they had to listen. Yes, exactly. And they had to do note taking, which is a quite a different skill than writing full sentences. And it is something that should be learned. Then they have to rewrite their notes and write in complete sentences. Next, they have to discuss. Or they have to first, they have to read their partner's stories. Then they discuss and agree and decide on the four to six or you know, any number that you decide, um, sentences that they're going to use for their, their story. Finally, they have to uh, trade with another group and think, um, use their memory of the story, um, and read and put the story in order again. So they've used a lot of skills to complete this activity. OK. Moving on to another activity, listen up. We are going to now listen to a third audio clip um, about two characters. You might know them, Tom Sawyer and Aunt Polly. As we're listening, I want you to write descriptions of the character in the chat box. So again, any, just any description that you hear about the character, or that you infer of the character based on what they're doing. For example, if Jenny's telling lots of jokes, you can write Jenny silly. You might not hear the word, but you can still write it. For example, you, it doesn't have to be word for word, but you can come up with adjectives based on what's happening. All right, so let's listen to our third audio clip. Tom? No answer. Tom! No answer. The old lady looked around the room. When I find you, I... She did not finish. With her head down, she was looking under the bed. Only the cat came out. She went to the open door and looked toward the garden. No Tom was there. She shouted. You, Tom! There was a little noise behind her. She turned and caught a small boy, stopping him before he could escape. What were you doing in that corner? Nothing. Nothing? What is that on your hands and face? I, I do not know, Aunt Polly. I know. You've been eating sweets. I have told you a hundred times not to eat those sweets. Her hand was raised in the air. It started down. It was very near. Oh, look behind you, Aunt. The old lady turned. The boy ran. In a moment, he was up on the high board fence. Then, he was on the far side of it. His Aunt Polly was surprised. Then, she laughed a little. That boy, I never know what he would do next. And he knows that I do not want to hit him. But I should. And if he does not go to school this afternoon, I must make him work tomorrow. He does not like work, especially on Saturday when there is no school. He does not like work. All the other boys will be playing. But I must try to make him a good boy. He is my dead sister's son, and it is my duty. I must do my duty. Tom did not go to school, and he had a very happy afternoon. He came home late. He hurried to do his share of the evening work. 
His brother Sid had already finished his share. Sid was a quiet boy who had no adventures and also no trouble. Great, so I see a lot of adjectives um, in the chat box. And a lot of these we didn't hear Mark Twain write or say. Um, we inferred them from what was happening in the story. So um, I see that Polly is old. And we knew that Polly was old even before we heard her, him say later that the old lady, because of her voice, worried because she her voice went up in intonation and she sounded like she was screaming because she was looking for Tom. Tom small, Tom sneaky because of what Aunt Polly was saying. Polly frustrated. Tom afraid, Polly surprised, amused, Tom lazy, um, Polly determined, Tom happy. So pretty much most of these adjectives we did not hear, but we were able to understand, not only because of the words or because of what the characters were doing, but also because of the intonation. Um, and that's something that we won't really get from just reading, but we will get from the audiobooks. So, um, this is an activity that we can do uh, called character comparison. Um, and it can be vocabulary building and comprehension as well. So what type of diagram is this? Yes, it is a Venn diagram. Um, and why would we use this type of diagram to compare characters? Because you can see the two circles overlap. So the parts that don't overlap are the contrast, so the differences between the two characters, the characteristics that they don't share, and then in the middle will be the ones that are the same. And I think it would be tricky for Aunt Polly and Tom to have any that are in that middle circle. Um, but this is something that you, know, you could do after just one passage, like we just did now, that has a lot of information about characters. But it can also be done after reading an entire book. And then you might have a better idea of um, you know, how to describe these characters. And I think an even more interesting thing to do would be to compare two characters from two different books that you've read in class, um, and then even create a scene where these two characters meet and determine how they would react or respond to the situ situation that your students create uh, based on their character. So maybe let's have Tom Sawyer meet Barack Obama. Okay, well, he's not a character in a book, but maybe he could meet Alice in Wonderland. And so you could come up with a whole story of what happens when they meet uh, based on their different characters. And here's another example of a graphic organizer that students can use to think about the different characters. And this just kind of breaks it down a little bit more. Um, I just think graphic organizers are really helpful in uh, getting students to organize their thoughts. And at the end of this, I'll show you a website that has a lot of great examples. OK, are you ready? Listen up. We're going to do our last uh, listen of audiobooks for today. And your job right now is to listen to the beginning of this story. And I'm going to play it twice. After the second time, I want you to write in the chat box just one to two sentences of what happens next. So it could be what happens way down the line. It could be what happens in the next minute. It's your choice. Be creative. Um, I can't wait to see what you guys come up with. Let's listen. One dollar and 87 cents. That was all. She had put it aside one cent and then another and then another in her careful buying of meat and other food. Della counted it. Three times. One dollar and eighty-seven cents. And the next day would be Christmas. There was nothing to do but fall on the bed and cry. So Della did it. Okay, so um, I see someone in the chat, rock, chat box wrote, Della robbed a store. So after Della realized she had no money to buy Christmas presents, she went and she robbed a store. That is a great example. 
Um, okay, so what kind of activity is this? What are we doing or what skill are we asking our students to do? You said it, predicting or prediction. So why do we do prediction activities? It's not memorizing facts. This is nothing that already happened in the story. But again, it's getting students to activate their prior knowledge, to be creative. Um, it's an important life skill to think about what's going to happen next. Um, so here's what we similar to what we just did in a little bit of an extension. Have students listen to a piece of a story two to three times, or again, as many times as you need. Then put students in pairs or groups and have students create a scenario to finish the story. And there's two ways that you can do this. Have students perform the story, I call it act two, or if it's not time permitting have students write part two of the story. But really having them perform it is great um, because they really have to think through what their, their scenario that they've created. They can also act in character, which gives them an opportunity to try out different accents. Um, and they get to speak and perform, um, which is you know, two other skills that you're adding to this activity. Other activities that you could do for prediction, task, prediction tasks are writing a chain story. So similar to what we just did, but perhaps after someone wrote Della robbed a store, then the next person in the class has to come up with the next sentence. And it just is kind of fun and silly because students have to think quickly um, and they have to you know, understand what the person in front of them said to come up with the next line. So, after Della robbed a store, she decided she didn't want to buy anyone Christmas presents because now she had all this money and she was going to take a trip to Paris. That's my chain. And then it can go on from there. Also, writing a prequel. What is a prequel? I know what a sequel is. So a prequel would come before. So having students think about what happened before they heard this story? What is the background to why Della's broke? Um, and they can come up with a whole story there. So these are just um, some examples of activities that you can use in your classroom to adapt and change and extend. Um, so do you have any questions about the activities that we talked about today? Or are there any other activities or skills that you'd like to share before we move on to our last piece? the webinar. And remember, I will be on the name. So if there's something that you try out in your class or something that you didn't understand from today, I can also answer your questions there. And please, please share with us any ideas you have related to using audiobooks. OK. So now I just want to share a couple of resources with you that can um, further help you with using audiobooks in the classroom. This one is really great, and this is uh, the, the website I was talking about that has a lot of graphic organizers. Um, you do have to become a member of this website to access their resources, but it's completely free. You just have to sign up. But again, what I found most useful on this site was under strategies and activities, and then graphic organizers. But there's also a lot of information about um, why using audiobooks in the classroom has become popular and some of the different um, techniques and things that they've done. Another website is ESL Bits. These are audio files that have been selected specifically for English language learners, and then they've been put into categories um, such as audiobooks, audio dramas, songs, and then also into levels, intermediate and advanced. Um, Something that's interesting about this site is that you can also select the speed of the audio file. Um, so you can select the fast version or the slow version. And finally, the last resource um, is called Open Culture. And this is a site that has a ton of free and downloadable resources, not just audiobooks. 
Um, but this site does have over 450 free audiobooks to download. Um, one suggestion is that you definitely need to listen to the audio first. Um, determine if the audio file is good quality. A lot of them on the site, unfortunately, don't sound very natural. So I suggest looking for files that say something like read by the author or read by a specific person, because they're often more interesting to listen to. Um, and also, you know, you need to determine whether it's appropriate for your audience. Some of them may be too advanced, and some of them do have inappropriate content for some levels. So, and then uh, one thing that I found that was especially interesting on Open Culture is an animated audiobook of The Old Man and the Sea by Hemingway. So it's not just um, an audiobook, but there's kind of a slow animation behind that gives the students images 